um, my goal with Matthew Davis was that past the seat belt is going to be a bumpy flight. So before we enter that flight, I would like to bring your attention back to Siegfried um, for two aspects. One is because I think that Mr. Kastoff sometimes may seem as the quintessential German kind of thin lip with a big message and a big lack of humor. And I found a little thing happening on Secret which, which I thought uh, was quite funny and also shows you a bit the way that he works and he thinks. But again, it needs, um, it needs background information and I wasn't sure if every one of you had that. Uh, I think you all remember when Wotan uh, stripped off his shirt and his, uh, his chest was naked and he had a Christian cross on that. Um, now you may wonder why that was the case. And um, some of you may remember that four, three or four years ago, when the actual um, Dutchman started, there was a huge scandal because, for reasons that I don't know, only on the premiere, the uh, Dutchman had to strip naked as well, uh, 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 strip naked on his chest as well. And being a Russian singer, he had a big swastika tattoo on his chest. Now, I don't know why nobody had checked on that before, but it happened. And um, all the alarm clocks in Bayreuth went on, there was a big pandemonium and it ended with um, this singer having to leave the cast and be recasted with the Korean singer that we are listening to until today. Now what that shows to us is what Kastov is doing throughout the entire production. Um, uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday when we saw this Christian um, cross, nobody went off on it. Um, so that means any symbol is what it means in our perception and not what it means in itself. Both are just crosses, but one with our anticipation, with our history, with where we come from and where we maybe want to go to, lets us uh, even change the whole production. The other one will just pass by and um, have uh, caused no rumor, uh, uh, no commotion at all. The second one kind of goes, the second remark they want to make is it goes kind of in the same direction and it is to all of you, um, or to them that you meet tonight on the uh, outside of this room, that may ask you uh, in how far is Kastov working in a Wagnerian sense? And that's a question that asked like this is always very difficult to answer, one would tend to say not, not at all. Now, I thought uh, the day before yesterday, when we looked at this story of how Secret gains Notum, that uh, Kastov got uh, authorization to work in terms of deconstruction from the highest authority, i.e. Wagner himself. Because what Wiener was trying all the 18 years long, or 19, 20 years long, when he was raising a Secret, was to mend and repair his sword. What uh, Secret did, and immediately succeeded to regain the old power to the sword, or maybe a new power, was he destroyed it completely, he melted it up, and then turned it into something completely new. And that, in short words, is exactly what deconstruction is about. So I just wanted to share that with you. And now we go to the Gotter Domino and to Anwaiden. Gotter Domino has three stages. Three Sets. And we begin in the East, East Berlin, Socialist East Berlin, and with the uh, large staircase from Battleship Potomkin, um, it's called the Odessa Staircase, which we'll see some very, very interesting scenes there. We will have Gunther Hagen and Brunhilde meet there and make some very, very important decisions there. As there was a first shot from that ship, or supposedly have been a first shot, there is also a huge decision that changes and changes the lives of all of the people on stage. And where Siegfried becomes then a, a savior in that he brings about the destruction and allows the world to begin again. Um, the other part of the set is West Berlin and we have the um, kebab shop, vegetable stall, which usually comes together having a big kebab stall and a, so, um, um, and the stall, and, um, and it's in the corner of Berlin. And on on this, on the on the staircase, you there is also on one side of the staircase there is the New York Stock Exchange. So it's kind of like a parallel reality. It is at one time it was, it's covered. Also, it has been covered as the Reichstag, and you have known it to have been covered. And there could be a lot of implications to it having been covered not exactly what it looks like. 
And on the side of this building, the New York Times, you said you have plaster, a, a very big sign, plaster to the luster, which you, also, you always have going into to East Berlin when you go in and when you go out. And um, um, there are many, ca there are cars in this production. There are cars that the Rheinmaidens are driving. They are drive a, a beautiful black Mercedes. And there is another car which shows um, the bourgeoisie that Gudrun gets as a gift, where she's very proud. She will not allow anybody to lean on it or sit on it or touch it. And it becomes really a symbol of what their lives were, what they had made up of their lives, how they had made. Now, when the Norns come in, um, the Norns um, speak the whole story. They tell you the whole story of the past. But the past that you see in this production is not the past that you are used to. This is another generation, especially in Gotterdam, you, you become aware that these, these people are another generation, that, that this is really about the Germans. Um, this is about socialism. Uh, socialism. The Norns are in a parking lot or an entrance where it's normally would be a, a set of steps going down or up in the parking lot. And they have set up an altar, a voodoo altar in this in this in this area. And they are they've got candles, they've got blood, they are stained with blood, they, they it, it's like it's it's almost as though he was making um Castor was making a reference to voodoo voodoo economics that is just like everything is almost by magic, it doesn't work by what we are used to. We are at the point where it is so so hidden or so falling apart that we are wondering just exactly what what is going on. So the, the Norns go into the story that we normally know, but everything around them is not what we normally know. It is very confusing. It, it brings in religion. It's uh, but religion that doesn't have to be churches, more a religion of football or um, it's, it's got blood. It's um, it's as though we were fighting impossible ends. Really, really. An, an impossible situation. You you wonder now why are what what's going on here? I, I know when I saw it last year, I had the same feeling. So I'm telling you what what he has said and what I have seen also when I saw it last year. Um, this is Siegfried when he is there with Brunhilde. He is thinking this, this scene is in an old way. Um, Brunhilde stays home and Siegfried Siegfried he goes off to be a hero, to find the world, to find himself, and Brunhilde, in essence, sort of stays home. But the world that they live in is, is, not, is not that kind of a world anymore. As we saw in, in Siegfried, you know, the, the movie pictures of him, he, he looked very sad and very depressed. And um, it was alluded that he was sort of a very imp impressionable person and that he was a little bit, um, that he was more than just a little bit depressed. That he's, he's really sort of depressed and lost, okay? And um, his, he, his, um, his entrance into the, the world with Brunhilde is not exactly as Brunhilde may have, may have expected. Um, um, Castor, in, in this, Act two, when he does the group scene, um, is much like his folks Buna, where much of the costuming and much of the confusion is like what he brings from his own experience in his own theater in Berlin. Um, here we have a lot of gangs, leather. It's very realistic. Realismus is it, it's it's um, but at the same time, I thought looking at the picture of it today on the screen that it looked much like a managing body, of, of a governing body. You have a huge building before, on front of, over the kebab. It's, it's, the building has the kebab shop on the corner, and it is several apartments with these metal steps going up, a large set of metal steps, and then steps going up all through the front. Well, this, the, the people in this scene are on these steps, and there, most of the of the conversation takes place 
between those standing on the steps and those on the side of the steps, you have these other bodies that are answering the choruses, and they are by by groups of people in very square boxes. So it, it looks like it, it, it's, it's an impression as though it's, it was a managing body that they were doing um, the, its politics. And it's, it's very visually political to me when I, when I really saw them doing this. And this is where um, most of the, the spear uh, takes place, the situation with the spear. This is set in the 50s or 60s. And Gunther has a hairdo very much like Hell's Angels. And Hagen has this very high, um, like a Mohawk hairdo. It's sort of like um, one of the um, Valkyrie also had this hat that was uh, the same impression. So, so this is a completely different world. Very, very modern, but very, very much today's world. It's very, very much what we are seeing today very stylized. Um, we see um, okay. um, Gunther. Uh, no, we, uh, I'm sorry. Um, Hagen appears as a very um, tragic figure, okay? Um, because he is so out of source to begin with. His mother has given himself, herself to, to Alberich and he has been born. And also Gunther is, is, is tragic because he is living in a sort of an opposite side of Hagen. He is, um, he is a son that was there and his heredity or his, his title in a sense is not taken away but the strength of Hagen has taken from him and eventually takes his life. And um, so this was very interesting because it's a sort of like a decomposing of society where, where it was uh, it's just falling apart. And we see it falling apart where we least are expecting it, even outside of the pictures that he's showing us. Because we are, going, we are going to see a lot, a lot of pictures. I'm telling you mostly the story, but there is also a lot of, a lot of pictures that will come up. Um, uh, the Siegfried becomes an instrument to, um, to Hagen and to Gunther because they give him this potion to drink. He forgets everything, present, past, I mean, not the, the past, and he forgets what he has, what he has had with Brunhilde completely. He's totally blank. And so he becomes uh, an instrument for this. He sort of joins, it's like joining a corporation. Um, he joins a political and very intriguing world. He becomes a partner in the Givichon's enterprise. So now we have Siegfried working for them and not working for the world or for what he had set up, all the principles that he and Brunhilde had, um, had set up that they would follow. And I think this is much what Castor is trying to tell us, that as, as long as we are joining all of, uh, a lot of, he, he talks about, in essence, contracts, contracts and institutions, and how to be careful. It's, it's, men can be corrupted, and, and life then begins to change if they are not used really for the benefit of the, of the human beings, but for other benefits only to serve a, a, a few. So it becomes very, um, very sad. Um, Waltraud's visit is, uh, is, is interesting, but uh, Waltraud, she uh, comes to request that Brunhilde gives her uh, the ring, because she has the ring. And um, I think the quality that really comes out in Brunhilde is her, her great loyalty. And um, I think that also Waltraud's visit is used by Castor to foreshadow it gives us, in this incredible world that we have already, that we will have experienced, it will barrage us with it, and uh, uh, we will also experience that the gods are in total, they are just falling. They, they are falling. It's, it's like the meeting that I also mentioned uh, in front of the steps. It is significant that the meeting to, to, to kill Siegfried takes, in, takes place in front of the steps, because the steps are going down. And it seems like the entire, the entire um, Gotterdammerung is a trip into destruction. 
so that the world can begin again. But it's all these little signs that make it meaningful that you catch now or you catch later. And it's just sort of a, a, an amazing kind of thing. Um, it's a wonderful story. Um, so the videos, at this, at this point, you're going to see um, videos of voodoo. They're, they're going to be voodoo videos that are going to come up. The voodoo is going to keep coming up here and there on the screen. And then there is going to be sections where you're going to see a doll, which this doll could be interpreted as Brunhilda's. Um, maybe it's not just only uh, the curse, and it's not just meant for Siegfried. It's, it could be for Gunther, who has married um, Brunhilda, and, um, and it could be Brunhilda's anger. Brunhilda's anger at the situation that she finds herself in, and it's being expressed in a way that is familiar to this crazy world and not in, in a way that we would have become accustomed to seeing it. So, um, the Rhine maidens are um, definitely prostitutes. And that Siegfried is very violent. I mean, he's with them and he would like to rape all of them and he's, he's lost. He's, he's a very depressed character who is completely lost, who has lost sight of his, his, his sight, his life, and he is completely gone, is left, he has, already, he has left Uron Hilda in his thoughts a very long time ago. Um, they come in a black Mercedes, um, and um, it, it seems like, uh, it was mentioned in the lecture that it was sort of like West Side Story, except now here we have East Side Story also. We have the east and the west and the disparity of it all. And it seems to me that what Castro is, is really um, talking about is, is the situation between east and, and west Berlin, which, uh, which was difficult for us to, uh, for me to, uh, to really come to an understanding when I came the first time. Um, Mr. Friedrich says this is not an apology. There is no apology on stage. Castro presents you with a series of images and confusing, a uh, confusing world that some of us may not know. We we live in the more idyllic world, or maybe we live when we come to see the ring. We we live an idyllic ring. So now this is not an apology for an identity story, an identity story which is meant to unravel what is going on in East Germany, what its relationship is to to West Germany, and and vice versa. Um, uh, the gods are gone. <laughs> There is, he, he says, there is no end. It's almost sadistic. There is no key. There is no moral to this story. The one that we are seeing, the, the, this production, there is no moral. There is a, no apology, but you are being asked to look at an identity, the identity that he has before, before us. Okay, thank you, Anna. Um, I think structurally I have to take you back to the beginning of the opera now. Um, uh, as I've already said, I think this is the only opera that has true pro prologues as an opera. And um, I think that you see tonight that both uh, Wagner and Kastor used these prologues in the same kind of purpose, which meant that in this um, short bit, he, uh, it always anticipates the entire six hours to follow. Now, what is that? <coughs> what does this mean? First of all, we have uh, the three notes that represent presence, past, and future. Um, and what the whole Götterdämmerung is showing us is what, what happens to one person or people or maybe a nation when they lose all the three of them. Now at the end of Prologue 1 when the, when, the, when the rope is cut, it is that they lost their past. Um, and it says, for bias, ewig is wissen, the end of eternal knowledge. And the eternal knowledge is the only entrance um, or entrance ticket that you have to create a future. So, um, well, what we find later on in Siegfried is a person that has lost obviously his past because this drink he's got to get makes him forget. And therefore, he can't gain a future, especially not a good one, and he, um, I hope we agree on that, um, acts rather stupidly in his presence. Um, if you would have asked, um, oh no, let me put it the other way around. Um, this is one bit um, why Kastorf probably uh, used the Götterdämmerung to talk about the West German society after World War II. The second one is, again, uh, Brunhild and Siegfried sh uh, showing Siegfried as a depressed person. Now, if you ask somebody suffering severely from depression, 
They wouldn't say they were sad or tired. They would say they suffer from not being able to feel anything. So, and this is exactly what happens to Siegfried through the entire opera again. So I think Gustav has a good point here, portraying him as a depressed person. And also, when you then start uh, therapy depressed people, you find out that they have something in their past that they haven't really resolved with. So this, again, is something why I would think Gustav had very good reasons to um, uh, use this part of the whole ring to go into the West German, uh, West German history. You will find these three uh, voodoo priests, or these three norms, dressed in the tricolor colors of the German flag, yellow or gold, red and black. And that, again, to me, is um, a kind of authorization that I might follow this, with these my thoughts. Um, and the, the, the story takes us, I would say, more likely into the 60s and 70s, or uh, 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 60s or 70s in Germany. And I think if you would have asked an um, average German right after the war if fairy tales were still coming true, what their greatest wish would have been, and this wish for some goes up even until today, it would have been, let's forget about everything and start new, let's pretend nothing has happened. So this big topic, is it um, a wish to come through, or is it rather a drama if you forget? Is the, the theme on Rotterdamer, and you could also see it is a big uh, uh, subject on the West German history. Um, so, um, what was the situation like after the war? Uh, there were maybe two uh, two ways to get out, uh, um, to get out of or to get into a state of forgetting, as you couldn't reach it on the direct way. The GDR had declared themselves to be the better Germany, which meant that everybody who lived in, uh, in, in East Germany was automatically communistic or socialistic and therefore had nothing to do with the past. As we have learned just recently, the way they did it was if an ex-Nazi was willing to give up his uh, Nazi membership and trade that in into a socialistic uh, membership, he already immediately was whitewashed. So that not only brought up their, their, their membership statistics in the East, but it made it very practical and easy to kind of give proof that um, this was the part of Germany that was never included in anything having to do with the Third Reich. The West German part was more pragmatic. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Adenauer, our first councillor, is known for the quote, I don't throw away muddy water as long as I don't know that I'm going to have fresh one. So you could think that is um, a bit kind of questionable attitude. Uh, whatever it is, it's very pragmatic and very practical, and therefore it needed another way to forget. And that started in 1948 when the Russians closed the borders to uh, West Berlin and the oil. And it comes again, uh, made it possible that uh, uh, England and America could start the air raid to protect uh, uh, West Berlin. And from there on uh, started something that was later known as the German economical wonder, which meant that with the help of the Allied, Western Allied uh, countries, Germany had an incredible race to become a top industri industrial nation again. And the way that got reflected in, in the public was uh, in certain waves. The first wave was called the Presswelle, which meant people stuffed food into themselves as if there was no tomorrow. And if you remember the cuisine of the 1950s, that was everything else they're becoming. And once they had gone through that, it, they started the traveling, the, the Reisewelle. Um, this is the car that I would like um, refer to, the Isetta. The Isetta was a very small uh, 1950s car that for the first time again gave uh, the illusion of mobility, which also meant, meant that the Germans were invited to go come back into the ring of the civilized nations and were able to travel because that was the big dream or the big um, lifestyle of these years in general. So whenever the cars come in and these productions, and you will see, they do a lot. As, for example, the rain maidens driving this beautiful old Mercedes, which was immediately, again, the car of the uh, new elite that very often used to be the old elite. Um, the Isetta is the symbol of this new economically successful Germany uh, and, and, and fulfills the dream that you could literally drive away from your past. Um, now, if there, was one, if there was one place in Germany where you definitely weren't able to forget, and this goes for until today, this was Berlin. Berlin is a city so full of scars from all 
cards of German and European history that you can can't literally walk down a road without meeting one or two aspects of the German history. So there's absolutely no way of hiding that in that town. And that's probably why it's so utterly disgusting and ugly on the one hand, but also one of the most interesting places, at least in, in Europe, until today, and so much impulse come out of it. The, the situation in Berlin right, after, uh, uh, right until um, reunification was absolutely artificial. Um, the, the, the wall was dividing the city, as you know. East, German, East Germany tried to dress up uh, East Berlin as their window to the West, proving that they had succeeded with their system. The same did West, try West Berlin. The problem was that West Berlin didn't really belong to Germany due to the uh, not yet existing peace contracts of World War II. It was still under the uh, reinship of the three Western alien forces. And the whole economy in West Berlin was entirely depending on West Germany. Whereas cities like Munich, Düsseldorf, Frankfurt bloomed up to be very modern and beautiful cities, Berlin remained in this kind of post-war, in-between status, even architecturally. And um, the West Germany pumped in money both to make industries go there, they had tax deduction, whereas workers that would work in Berlin, they had uh, tax benefits coming out of that, and that kind of kept up very side, a very artificial uh, economics, both sides of the wall, kind of, but trying to prove, and here we come back to theory and, and, and realism, that is a major topic for Mr. Karstoff, and that he kind of compares through all the ring, it, both sides of the wall were representing the idea, the ideal idea of what the systems were about, at the same time as they proved that these ideas, ideals were not able to be reached. So I think Mr. Castor, for this and many other reasons, has, has, has good reasons to put Goethe de Baron into Berlin. And he chooses several locations for that, and I'm, I hope I have time enough to quickly run through them to give you an idea why he chose this uh, location. Now, Adelaide already uh, talked about the, uh, the Reichstag that was wrapped up by Christo. Now, this was an art project that was already uh, planned before unification. You have always to remember unification hit us overnight. Nobody was expecting it, no matter what people say today. And most of people, my generation, didn't even long for it. We were fine. I was born when the wall was erected. I didn't mind. I, I, you know, I, I, I didn't like the idea of it, but I was never thinking of a unification to happen or have that as a solution for anything. So, um, th this plan to wrap up the rice that existed, but uh, West, uh, uh, Western politicians objected against it. The Reichstag was just on the border of West Berlin. Behind the Reichstag, and behind means behind like in your back, was the wall. Uh, so this was the, the, the ultimate edge, one of the ultimate edges of Berlin. And then all of a sudden after unification, it became the German parliament as you know, and kind of the center of our system again. So, um, <clears throat> There were huge discussions going on about whether or whether or not had this uh, building over to Mr. Christopher for, I think, one or two months? How long did it last? Months, I think. Didn't it? Well, I think it was planned for about, let's say, four, four to six weeks or something. Uh, but finally, uh, the Berlin uh, um, parliament decided, they, or even the German, actually there was a, um, a, a questioning hour in the German parliament about it, so you can see how uh, high this symbol was valued. Um, they decided, yes, we're going to do this. And what happened, because this was like about half a year of unification, for the first time, the city felt reunified. It was people from East and West that would meet on that spot uh, from day to, 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 to the morning of the next day, um, doing whatsoever, meeting up. And for us, Berliners was the first time an idea of what Berlin um, could be like after unification, and we had a physical place where to explore that or to have experience about it. Um, I remember I was flying back from London during this week once, and Lufthansa had the special service that they, on, on their way flying into Tegel, they would make an extra round uh, uh, around the uh, uh, Reichstag so that people that were arriving in could have a first impression of that. So the, the symbol of this um, art action, of this uh, performance or, or, or art monument, uh, is not to be underestimated. And every German, again, probably other than uh, all of you, can read this immediately when he sees the image we're going to see tonight on stage. 
So then the, uh, uh, the surprise is even bigger when later on, and I wasn't really sure whether we should even tell you this or, or have you had the shock yourself, but now you know it anyway, uh, when then the wrapping is falling apart and instead of the Reichstag that at least all Germans would expect, it's uh, a Wall Street that comes up as a building. Now don't beat Mr. Kastoff uh, immediately. There is a quote by Bayer Wagner that said Valhalla is Wall Street. So, uh, um, uh, you know, again, um, there are other people to be beaten for that idea. Uh, of course, pretty obviously, um, you could say the message, if there is a message with Mr. Kastorf at all, is something like, it is no longer parliament and democratic ideas ruling us, but uh, stock markets and stock exchanges. And again, the stock market, if you want that, is the one end of how to um, uh, how to uh, uh, value oil, the other end was, was this uh, uh, a cheap and, and almost uh, without value uh, plastic toys that we saw in Rheingold. So uh, again this reflects, uh, as we said before, there are also always these many levels of different discourses that uh, these kind of directors try to uh, link together. So. Um, the third, uh, the third location that is of interest is this uh, big step. You already always said this before in recent talks that always refers to Sergei Eigenstein and therefore represents the beginning of the socialistic realism. So this is where the revolution took place. And the other part of the stage is going to be a huge neon sign, Plaster und Elaster aus Gruppen. Now this is even more an inside joke for Germans and no, no one from abroad is suspected or expected to understand that. Um, if you were going uh, from, from West Germany to Berlin, which we as young students did all the time because Berlin was the place to be even then, but not the place where you could earn money, so you had to always go back, you would go through three, three transits. This was part of the, of the contract I spoke before. There was uh, uh, three streets that would uh, connect West Berlin to West Germany. Uh, if you, like I did for, for many, many years, were coming uh, from Hof, which is just like 30 kilometers from here, uh, that was the entrance into, the, into East Germany, and then would drive to uh, West Berlin, it was exactly uh, 300 kilometers. And the minute you would leave West Germany, or let's say, well, the, the front was well lit, it was excellently lit because they always wanted to make sure that you uh, wouldn't uh, take uh, people and try to escape. From the minute you left the, the front you went into the transit, you would kind of rather hop than bump into, uh, into the, the JDR because they still used the autobahn from the third right. They hadn't been doing anything about that. So you had this kind of, and you had a speed limit of 100 kilometers, so it was 300 kilometers, you knew it was three hours. After two hours, and the country was entirely dark as in black. You wouldn't see a single light when you drove by night. And almost like the rays of the sun after 200 kilometers on a bridge that crossed the Elbe River, there was this huge neon sign, again in the colors red, um, uh, yellow and black, uh, saying Plaster and Elaster of Oskopau. Uh, VEB Bluna was a Bluna, wasn't it? VEB was the abbreviation for Company of the People. It was in front of any company, so it was VEB Bluna. Uh, Bluna was a company that was already coming from the Third Reich because Germany always tried to uh, 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 install a petrochemical industry, uh, uh, especially at war times, uh, due to the lack of uh, natural resources uh, for, for oil or, or gas. Um, and Plaster and Elaste is, uh, East Germany uh, on some fields even try to create their own words. And Plaster is more familiar, translated to plastic, which is probably sounds familiar in areas as well. Elaste is elastic, which refers to rubber. Now what, what happened in this little place in Thuringia, um, about 100 kilometers away from Berlin, was this was the end of Drushba. You remember I told you about Drushba before? Drushba was the pipeline that pumped all the Russian oil into East Germany, and that was their kind of blood vein, if you want to say that, that kept their economy up. At the end, before the GDR came down, it was due to Mikhail Gorbachev and the perestroika that Russia sold more oil into Western countries because they needed uh, their, the foreign currency themselves 
and then all of a sudden the idealistic idea, uh, uh, socialism in uh, East Germany couldn't have been held up any longer because of the lack of oil again. So the, 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 um, uh, the whole, uh, uh, or the, one of the biggest industrial complexes in East Germany that kept made their economy run, if you could say that at all, um, was the petrochemical in the industry that took place there and which also led to that almost everything, including the chassis of cars in uh, the GDR were made out of plastic or plastic related uh, uh, materials. So um, for us, uh, you know, just wanted to go to West Berlin to party. This was like, thank God, it's only another hour to go, plus maybe 45 minutes where they treated you badly at the other frontier, plus uh, 20 minutes when you would go into the inter shops where they would uh, sell us cheap Western cigarettes for less money because they wanted to pick up on our on our Deutschmarks. So um, everyone who went to Berlin before unification has a, a definite relation to this uh, to this sign, and it may also show you because it ended up in the German Historical Museum in Berlin these days. So we know what we're talking about. Yeah. So um, and, and putting these two signs, uh, the, the steps of Eisenstein and the, this neon sign together on one stage is again the contrast between utopy and and, and, and realism, which we which custom is dealing with all the time, and he puts that, that as a kind of matrix on all system. What do you promise? What do you really do? And this is the kind of question he puts onto all our beliefs as well as to, onto all our, at least European societies throughout the ring. Um, the last location that I want you to get to know a little better is Kreuzberg. Kreuzberg is where the uh, donor shop is standing. Now, what is the donor shop? Well, what was West Berlin about before the wall came down? You could roughly say West Berlin was inhabited by three groups of persons. One were old Berliners uh, that were kind of personally, uh, um, kind of personally insulted uh, by the fact that they were no longer the, the Hauptstadt uh, members, and of, of course were rather conservative and thought they were the front fighters against communism, um, sitting quite away from the actual war. Uh, the second group were Turks. They were coming uh, to Germany as so-called Gastarbeiter, which is a bit of an emphasis on the part that is probably right, Arbeiter, uh, workers. If they were treated like this, I don't want to do too many comments on that. But they were called Gastarbeiters, and they were coming to Berlin because of this extra uh, tax benefit they were coming. So Berlin, uh, no, so Germany in general, uh, no, actually Berlin in general was the biggest Turkish community outside of Turkey, I think even until now, definitely in these years. And the, and the third group were people like us, students, artists, people that wanted to have a good time, that wanted to not be uh, forced to, uh, to uh, make a lot of money to afford a good life. And so there was a melange of these three groups. The first group would rather stay separately. Well, no, actually all these groups were kind of subcultures in their own sense and stayed separately. Uh, from each other, but the second and the third group would meet in a quarter that was called Kreuzberg. Now the special situation of Kreuzberg was that it was an appendix to West Berlin and for that reason was surrounded by the wall on three sides. There was almost only a couple of streets going into Kreuzberg and there was this joke for people like I that lived there, uh, we have only two, we, 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 we have the east on three sides, like the east is our general direction. And they were, you know, you only had to walk a couple of uh, meters to bump against the wall because here the wall would divide streets, even houses. Um, it was a bizarre situation, but it was also kind of biotop for all kind of social experiences that took place in Berlin. You have to remember that Berlin was the place where the 1968 movement in Germany started, which, funny enough, re uh, started with asking the parents' generation, what did you do in the war, and ending up with being sympathetic with the PLO and turning quite anti-Semitic as the second big movement, political movement in Germany, openly anti-Semitic. So that's a bit of tragic again that you can see history prevents at points. Um, so at the time you wouldn't find any, any social experience going on in, happening in Berlin. Might it be people moving together in, in big apartments, which was unusual before? Might it be uh, squattering houses? Um, 
whatsoever. Uh, on the other side, maybe the same houses that were in the standard that was positively, optimistically, 1920s, if not earlier, with you know, toilets on the floor and no central heating and all that, but cheap, uh, very cheap uh, uh, rent prices. Um, next to, to these people would live the Turks with their huge families, not able to speak German, being strangers in the country. Um, and where these two groups would, would meet would be the Döner Kebab uh, um, Imbiss shops. There were kind of two general fast foods in Berlin existing at the time. One was the famous currywurst that you probably heard about, and the other one was the Döner Kebab. The Döner Kebab, I think, was even invented in Berlin by a very clever turn. It is literally um, ham meat pressed together, or I think it's even mixed with pork meat, I'm not sure. It's, it's different kinds of meats pressed together uh, to, a, to an artificial building that then rotates in front of a flame and they cut down the roasted bits and put them in an open white bread and put some sauce and salad. Quite delicious and I must admit a part of my student budget went into um, <laughs> surviving with um, Döner Kebabs. So, um, uh, Kreuzberg and uh, Kastorf was clever enough to show that. He put it on the stage, it's on the back side of the Reichstag. If you say the Reichstag represents what democracy, democracy and capitalism hopes it is about, then Kreuzberg is then what happens in reality. And uh, it was a very, uh, there was a big, big poverty in, in Kreuzberg, and of course a lot of uh, social tension as well. Um, so Reichstag on the one side and Kreuzberg on the other side uh, um, uh, represent the quintessential, at least West Berlin, before the unification. So uh, uh, this brings me to the end. I don't know if we have time left, or you want to pick up? Okay. Well, I hope this helps a little bit to find your way through tonight's production. Thank you very much. So now we come to the end of our discussion, but it is not complete until we have a closing ceremony. I would like to present Nina Besser Eisler, who is executive director of the Gesellschaft. Would you come forward, please? I would like to present you with the complete collections of a grateful audience, uh, a gift of 465 euro uh, for the use of the Gesellschaft. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, David. It's a pleasure that you support the friends. And yes, of course, our mission is to support the Bayreuth Festival, as you know. And thank you very much, and I think it was a wonderful time you can, could give the lectures here to introduce Mr. Kastoff's work to a lot of different people. Thank you. Thank you. I want to uh, close uh, by reading a description of the Richard Wagner Festival that captures the spirit of the experience as best that words can do. It was written by Mark Twain in his travel journal to the festival in 1891. Yesterday, the opera Tristan and Isolde was presented. I have seen all sorts of audiences at theaters, operas, concerts, lectures, sermons, funerals, but none which was twin to the Wagner audience of Bayreuth for fixed and reverential attention, absolute attention, and petrified retention to the end of the act of an attitude assumed at the beginning of it. You detect no movement in the solid mass of heads and shoulders. You seem to sit with the dead. In the <laughs> you seem to sit with the dead in the gloom of a tomb you know that they are stirred to their profoundest depth, that there are times when they want to rise and wave handkerchiefs and shout their approbation, and times when tears are running down their faces, and it would be a relief 
to free their pent emotions in sobs and screams. Yet you hear not one utterance till the curtain swings together and the closing strains have slowly faded and died. Then the dead arise with one impulse and shake the building with their applause. This is an agreeable atmosphere to persons in whom this music produces a kind of divine ecstasy and to whom its creator is a very deity. His stage, a temple, the works of his brain and hands, consecrated things, and the partaking of them with eye and ear, a sacred solemnity. The pilgrim wends to his temple out of town, sits, sits on this moving service, returns to his bed with his heart and soul and his body exhausted by long hours of tremendous emotion, and he is in no fit condition to do anything but to lie torpid and slowly gather back life and strength for the next service. This opera of Tristan and Isolde last night broke the hearts of all witnesses who were of the faith. And I know of some who have heard of many who did not sleep, but cried the night away. Isn't that a lovely sentence? He says, I know of some who have heard of many who could not sleep, but cried the night away. I feel strongly out of place here. Sometimes I feel like the same, the same person in a community of the mad. Sometimes I feel like the one blind man where all others see, the one groping savage in the college of the learned. And always during service, I feel like a heretic in heaven. But by no means do I ever overlook or minify the fact that this is one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. I have never seen anything like this before. I have never seen anything so great and fine and real as this devotion. In ending, I want to praise, <clears throat> I want to paraphrase the song of Simeon. Now let us depart in peace according to the words, for we have seen and heard such beauty, and we are open to the finale, which ends with music of eternal hopefulness as a new beginning. Thank you.